on World News Tonight. Open Borders China opens up international borders for the first time in three years, despite rising cases nationwide. Calls for peace. Vladimir Putin offers negotiations of peace, but will Ukraine and the West oblige? Find out tonight. Frost continues. The bomb cyclone that struck the continental United States continues to take lives and wreak havoc. And festive Moscow. Moscow, despite risks of attacks, celebrates the festive season in lieu of the upcoming New Year's and Orthodox Christmas celebrations. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Tonight's top story is on China's major border announcement as a nation will drop quarantine requirements for international arrivals from January 8th in a major step towards reopening its borders that have shut the country from the rest of the world for nearly three years. Inbound travelers will only be required to show a negative COVID test result obtained within 48 hours before departure. China's National Health Commission said that currently they are subject to five days of hotel quarantine and three days of self-isolation at home. Restrictions on airlines over the number of international flights and passenger capacity will also be removed, according to the announcement. The easing of borders is part of a broader move by China to dismantle what was left of its long-held zero-COVID policy, which is abruptly abandoned early this month following nationwide protests over its heavy social and economic toll. Having rolled back lockdowns, mass testing and allowed positive patients to quarantine at home, the government is now scrapping other remaining preventative measures, including contact tracing. China has sealed its borders since March 2020 to prevent the spread of the virus, keeping itself in global isolation even as the rest of the world reopened and moved on from the pandemic. Foreigners have been largely banned from entering China apart from a limited number of businesses or family visits. The NHC said it will further optimize arrangements for foreigners to visit China for work, business, study or family reasons and provide convenience for their visa applications. Now, even though China plans to reopen borders, the nation still grapples with its first ever national COVID-19 wave. Emergency wards in small cities and towns southwest of Beijing are stunned as they attempt to reel with the massive influx of critical cases. Emergency rooms are turning away ambulances, relatives of sick people are searching for open beds, and patients are slumped on benches in hospital corridors and lying on floors for lack of beds. Hospitals in China are under siege from a new wave of COVID cases. One in Shanghai said it expected half of the city's 25 million people to get infected by the end of the week after Christmas. In Beijing, healthcare workers said patients might have to be turned away due to a lack of beds and resources. The new upsurge comes after President Xi Jinping's government suddenly abandoned strict measures aimed at stamping out the virus. State media say frontline workers have been told to work while sick while retired staff have been brought back in some areas. The country's National Health Commission has said it will stop publishing daily data on infections amid doubts over their reliability. But figures from one UK-based health data firm estimate China is facing more than a million infections and 5,000 deaths every day. Ordinary citizens are making their own estimates too. This woman says almost everyone she interacts with has been infected. Just a few days after Putin spoke of Moscow's willingness to end the war in Ukraine, Putin again on Christmas Day said that Russia is willing to negotiate with all parties involved in the war about acceptable solutions. Despite Moscow's repeated comments that it's open to negotiations, Ukraine and its Western allies suspect that such claims are a ploy to buy time. Russian President Vladimir Putin has said that Russia is ready to negotiate with all parties involved in the war in Ukraine about acceptable solutions and at the same time accused Ukraine and its Western allies of refusing to negotiate. Speaking with Russia on state television in an interview which aired on Christmas Day, Putin also said that he believes Russia is acting in the right direction defending its national interests. This comment comes after Putin said on Thursday that Moscow wants an end to the war in Ukraine. Our goal is not to spin the flywheel of military conflicts, but on the contrary, to end this war. We are striving for this and will continue to strive. Putin also added that ending the war would inevitably involve a diplomatic solution. 
Those comments came a day after President Volodymyr Zelensky visited the White House and U.S. President Joe Biden promised Zelensky continued U.S. support. Despite Moscow's repeated comments that it is open to negotiations, Q and its allies suspect that such claims are a ploy to buy time after a series of Russian defeats and retreats during the war in Ukraine. John Kirby, the White House spokesperson, says Putin has shown absolutely zero indication that he's willing to negotiate to end the war. Kirby told reporters during an online briefing that everything Putin is doing bespeaks a man who wants to continue to visit violence upon the Ukrainian people and escalate the war. He also said the White House was open to dialogue only if Putin showed seriousness about negotiations. Three Russian servicemen have died after a Ukrainian drone attack on a crucial airbase deep inside Russian territory. According to the Defense Ministry, a Ukrainian drone was shot down on the approach to Engels base. Early but falling debris killed three service personnel. The strike was the second recent attack on the airbase, located about 300 miles away from the Ukrainian border and more than 450 miles south of east of Moscow. The Ukrainian army is showing off its shiny new artillery pieces, such as these French-made Caesar howitzers already on the front line. In recent months, Ukraine has taken deliveries of more than 200 heavy artillery systems from the US and its NATO allies. Meanwhile, Ukraine's foreign secretary says that Kyiv aims to hold a peace summit by February next year, preferably at the UN with Secretary General Antonio Guterres as a possible mediator. In other developments, Russia's military has reported that it shot down a Ukrainian drone approaching an airbase deep inside Russia on Monday, the second time the facility has been targeted this month. Debris killed three servicemen at the Engels Air Base, according to authorities. In an attempt to cement his military gains, President Vladimir Putin has approved the granting of passports to those in four partially occupied Ukrainian regions, illegally annexed by Moscow this year. Along with current military drills being held in Belarus, it's led to fears that the conflict could yet again get hotter this winter despite the war going on for nearly a year now. South Korea's military scrambled fighter jets and attack helicopters after five North Korean drones crossed into the airspace, with one aircraft crashing, according to the country's defense ministry. The ministry said South Korea's military fired shots at the drones, but added it couldn't confirm whether any drones were shot down. South Korea scrambled jets and attack helicopters on Monday after it said five North Korean drones crossed into its airspace calling the incident a clear act of provocation. After firing initial warning shots, Seoul responded by opening fire to try to shoot down Pyongyang's aircraft, according to South Korea's military. Lee Seung-oh is an official with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Our military deployed manned and unmanned reconnaissance assets to areas close to the military demarcation line as well as North Korea to take corresponding measures in response to North Korean drones that violated our airspace. We conducted reconnaissance and operational activities such as photographing major military facilities of the enemy. Our military will continue to respond thoroughly and sternly to such provocations by North Korea. One of the five North Korean drones flew near the South Korean capital. The others flew near the west coast. Lee said they were small, about two metres, but didn't say what equipment, if any, they were carrying. North Korea has no government spokespeople and its state media made no mention of the drones. Lee did not say if any drones had been hit, though later the Yonhap News Agency said South Korea's military fired about 100 shots but failed to shoot anything down. South Korea's transport ministry said flights leaving from two airports were temporarily suspended following a request from the military. The drones the first confirmed to have come from the South's isolated neighbour since 2017, when one was found crashed on a mountain near the border. Relations between the two countries have recently been growing more tense since a new conservative government took over in Seoul and as North Korea presses on with its nuclear and missile programs. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. 
The death toll from a devastating winter blizzard that left much of the United States in a deep freeze has risen to at least 25 in a hard hard region of western New York state as tens of thousands remain without power. During a news conference, Erie County executives said at least 25 people had died as a result of the storm, which pummeled the area during the Christmas holiday weekend. As crews work to dig out the Snowden region around Buffalo, New York, officials are shedding more light on the dire consequences of the weekend storm. Over two dozen people have died in Erie County as a result of the powerful blizzard that paralyzed western New York State. Erie County Executive Mark Polencars on Monday told reporters the death toll is likely to rise as the medical examiner is working to confirm if other fatalities are directly tied to the weather. And this blizzard is the one for the ages. Certainly it is the blizzard of the century. The fierce blizzard, which New York Governor Kathy Hochul called an epic once-in-a-lifetime weather disaster, pummeled the area over the Christmas weekend, leading to over 500 rescues across the state. It capped an Arctic freeze and winter storm front that had extended over most of the United States for days, stretching as far south as the Mexican border. A Texas car wash had intense icicles, and there was a massive pileup on the Ohio Turnpike on Friday. In hard-hit Erie County, hundreds of National Guard troops were assisting emergency workers on Monday, rescuing people trapped in homes and cars and clearing mounds of snow. But it was proving to be difficult, with snow plows even getting stuck. A driving ban remains in effect for Buffalo, and officials are urging residents to stay home. The city of Buffalo is impassable in uh, most areas. Uh, while mains may have a lane open for emergency traffic or two, uh, meant most secondaries as well as side streets have not been touched yet. This is primarily because the efforts were going towards opening up areas around hospitals, around nursing homes, uh, around other emergent care locations. In some areas south of Buffalo and north of Syracuse, up to a foot of snow was still forecast to fall through Tuesday. Hundreds of migrants are camping in the cold at Mexico's northern border over Christmas, hoping for a swift reversal in restrictions imposed by the United States as they endure the bite of a winter storm ravaging the region. After the U.S. Supreme Court this week ruled that restrictions known as Title 42 could stay in place temporarily, many migrants are prepared to face a hectic week in what Mexico's weather service called a mass of Arctic air. Tonight, El Paso overwhelmed with migrants battling bureaucracy and bone-chilling cold. Venezuelan Luis Oler says he's not accustomed to temperatures in the 20s. Many staying warm in churches over Christmas, connected through song, but also pain. Others were left outside, like this little boy with just a few blankets. We've come for a better life, he said. At this El Paso Convention Center, there's a thousand beds inside, refuge for some, but only for those migrants who have the proper paperwork. The chaos against the backdrop of an unprecedented number of undocumented immigrant crossings at the southwest border in fiscal year 2022, 2.76 million, putting a massive burden on states like Texas. Buses leaving there and dropping families off in freezing temperatures outside Vice President Kamala Harris's D.C. home on Christmas Eve. The White House calling it a shameful stunt. A spokesperson for Governor Abbott countering the migrants had agreed to go. With the COVID era Title 42 allowing for the expulsion of many asylum seekers still in limbo, charities are picking up migrants along the southern border and taking them to shelters across the country. Shelters already stretched thin and right now with no solutions in sight. Hundreds of people marched in the French capital to pay tribute to the victims of the shootings of French Kurds. The incident had occurred at Kurdish Cultural Center and a nearby hairdressing salon on Friday. The city's bustling 10th district is home to numerous shops and restaurants and a large Kurdish population. Marching through the streets of Paris to pay tribute to the victims of Friday's deadly shooting. Members of the French Kurdish community held a peaceful protest on Monday after an attack on a cultural center left them fearing for their safety. They also called on French authorities to classify the shooting, in which three people were killed, as an act of terrorism. We want to be heard, to be reassured, to be protected. And we are asking authorities to get to the bottom of this incident. The main suspect, a 69-year-old Frenchman who was arrested at the scene of the shooting, 
was briefly held in psychiatric care before being placed in custody. Over the weekend, he confessed to a pathological hatred of foreigners, which he said stemmed from a burglary that left him depressed and traumatized. He reportedly told investigators, since the break-in, I've wanted to kill migrants and foreigners before committing suicide. The suspect said he initially planned to target foreigners in the northern Paris suburb of Saint-Denis before changing his mind at the last minute. He was known to police with two prior convictions for armed violence and illegal possession of a firearm. He was also charged with racist violence last year after allegedly stabbing migrants and destroying their tents with a sword. Serbian President Alexander Vucic dispatched the army chief to the border with Kosovo as strained relations between the two countries were exacerbated by recent blockades. Kosovo declared independence from Serbia in 2008, but Belgrade refused to recognize the move and encouraged the remaining 120,000 Serbs to defy Pristina's authority. A week after saying Kosovo was on the brink of armed conflict, Serbia dispatched its army chief to the border on Sunday marking the latest escalation between the two neighbors. Tensions boiled over earlier this month when hundreds of ethnic Serbs erected roadblocks across northern Kosovo, effectively paralyzing two border crossings. They were protesting the arrest of a former Serbian police officer who they say was targeted because of his ethnicity. Kosovo officials have since asked NATO peacekeepers to help remove the barricades and have accused Serbia of deliberately spreading misinformation in order to destabilize the country. Kosovo declared independence from Serbia in 2008, but Belgrade still refuses to recognize its sovereignty and regularly encourages some 120,000 ethnic Serbs living in Kosovo to defy authority. North Macedonia's government said it's imposing emergency measures in the country's capital Skopje and three other cities in order to protect people from severely high levels of air pollution. No sports events will be staged on any day with high air pollution levels and other outdoor activities will also be curtailed. North Macedonia has imposed emergency measures in the capital Skopje and three other cities to tackle soaring pollution levels. They've now risen to 28 times the safety threshold established by the World Health Organization. Sporting events have been cancelled and construction work limited to just six hours a day. Those with asthma and other chronic conditions are the most vulnerable. The government has also ordered welfare ministries to provide shelter for homeless people. Residents burning unclean fuels to heat their homes, vehicle emissions and industrial emissions are believed to be big causes of the smog. IQ Air, a Swiss air quality technology company, has ranked North Macedonia's capital as the third most polluted city in the world right now. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A boat carrying at least 180 Rohingya refugees reached the shores of Akhe, Indonesia, one day after another boat of 57 other Rohingya reached the province, having spent nearly a month adrift at sea. A court in military rule Myanmar will deliver its final verdict in cases against deposed leader Aung San Suu Kyi, wrapping up a marathon proceeding that has been condemned in the West as a sham. The death toll from Christmas Day rains in southern Philippines rose past a dozen, authorities said, with the search still on for nearly two dozen people as floods started to recede. A former Maoist guerrilla who led a decade long insurgency against Nepal's Hindu monarchy was sworn in as Prime Minister for a third time. Last month's election had returned a hung parliament. Brazilian soccer legend Pele's family members gathered at Albert Einstein Hospital in Sao Paulo, where the 82 year old, widely considered one of the greatest footballers of all time, has been since late November. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. The festive season in Moscow has not seemed to die down despite the risk of attacks. We leave you tonight with Russian citizens doing their best to keep up with the holiday spirit. Stay safe and have a great night.